What would you do if someone tried to blow your head off? Jack's solution is the standard answer. He uses his arm to fend off his opponent's attack, then punches him in the face, followed by a kick that knocks him down. He then grabs another opponent's arm and breaks it, then stomps on his leg, and finally punches him to the ground. Jack would never say another word if he could deal with a problem violently. The gangsters never thought that they would provoke such a monster. Continuing from the previous video, after determining how to deal with the congressman, Tanner went out to make a phone call. Kelly brings up Swan again, only to be interrupted by Jack before he can finish his sentence. Jack remains convinced of Swan's innocence and won't accept any negative comments about Swan. Kelly emphasized that Swan had disappeared like the rest of his comrades, that his body had never been found, and that his home had never been destroyed. Jack said Swan wouldn't let his dog die of thirst. He's not like that. Kelly didn't want to talk about it anymore. The atmosphere instantly dropped to freezing point, and Lucy tried to break the awkwardness by adding sugar to the coffee. And Jack thought of something when he saw the sugar. It turns out that two years ago, they were both in the army at that time. Under Jack's command, their team cracked a mega drug case. But while everyone was celebrating the success, Swan poured cold water on them. He said that people in their line of work end up overseas. We'll be shy at, bombed, blown up somewhere. But the criminals would make more money selling this stuff than their pensions combined. The crowd was so surprised by his words that they were speechless, and he hastened to explain that it was just a joke. A nearby teammate asks how much 48 kilograms of flour would be worth. Lucy corrected him by saying 47 kilograms. Jack also reminded him that this figure cannot be wrong. Tom said it was 48 kilograms when he loaded it into Swan's car. Jack realized that this was a serious matter and suggested checking Swan's car. Several people opened the boot of Swan's car, but there was nothing inside. But then Swan found a packet of flour in the gap between the seats and said that it might have accidentally fallen down when he was driving. Although Jack did not suspect Swan, Kelly thought it was not that simple. But looking at Jack's sincere face, Kelly did not say anything more. Tanner is very efficient. It didn't take him long to find Congressman Lofa's confidant, who is Lofa's legislative director, named Danny. According to Tanner's description, this man grew up without any setbacks. His parents were so powerful, not only did they get him into a top law school, they got his DUI and prostitution charges dropped. And after graduation, they got him a job at one of the top law firms in the country. And now he's in charge of drafting bills for Congress. Lucy thinks he's a simple rich kid who never thinks about the consequences. Jack guessed that Lucy was planning to use her body to seduce Danny to get information. Everyone agrees to her plan. Through Tenor's investigation, Danny will be attending a concert in Boston tonight, and it's their only chance to try to take Danny down. While they're talking, Jack's phone rings. It's Sheriff Gil also. It was Sheriff Gil also who hadn't answered Jack's call before. So when he answered it, Sheriff Gil also cursed at Jack. He already knows about the break-in, so he needs Jack to share his information with him. Jack explains that he's trying to share information with him, and that's why he's on the phone. Jack sends him a list of security personnel, and wants Sheriff Gilasso to help him look into it. Gilasso gets angry and says, I'm not your clerical assistant. Jack said they were going to a concert in Boston. Jack hung up the phone after saying that, but before they left, they had one more thing to do. Jack and Tanner teamed up and went to a flower corner. Thinking that Tanner was a cop, the drug dealer got up and started to run away, only to be swung over by Jack, who was hiding behind the wall. Jack took all the flour from the punk's pockets without a second thought. Tanner dismantled the punk's weapon and threw it down the drain. On the other hand, Lucy and Kelly have arrived at the home of Mike, the head of New Generation Security. They were ready to catch Mike and have a good chat with him, but after searching Mike's house, they didn't see any trace of Mike, but the clothes scattered on the floor and the jewelry on the countertop seemed to tell them that Mike had just escaped not long ago. But Lucy quickly rejected this speculation because she found a large amount of cash in the room. Obviously even if he was in a hurry to escape, he would never forget to bring money with him, indicating that Mike had not been home for a long time. At the same time, the middleman named Carlos came to the beauty parlor. But this time, his purpose wasn't plastic surgery, but to outlaw this doctor. He slashed the doctor's throat when he wasn't looking. Being well versed in medical skills, he knew very well that as long as he cut off the other person's windpipe, the blood would stay in the lungs, and then the other person would be suffocated, followed by catastrophic paralysis. The nervous system would stop working, and the other person would soon die. After the doctor died, Carlos took the doctor's wallet and glasses, and went out and killed the nurse outside, and casually wrote down a shutdown tag, and stuck it on the wall to buy time for his operation. Jack and his team all bought new outfits to go to Boston to cash Danny, the director of legislation, so that they could raise their status. Soon Kelly came out with her new clothes, the two are shocked by her beauty, but the moment Lucy walked out, Jack frowned in his tracks. She was too beautiful to be seen, and Lucy even threw a wink when she passed by Jack. Jack's soul was almost seduced, 
Kelly reminded Jack to watch his image and keep his mouth shut. Soon they arrived at the music hall. Lucy passed by Danny in a sexy black dress, but she quickly turned around. She said she couldn't find her seat and hoped that Danny could help her out. Danny was very attentive and took the ticket and looked at it. He said that Lucy's seat was not good and suggested that Lucy could switch seats with his assistant and sit next to him. Lucy asked, wouldn't his assistant mind? Danny said his assistant would mind losing her job. Lucy's action managed to make the rich boy unable to stop himself. When the concert was over, Lucy invited Danny to a party tonight and asked him to accompany her. Danny, who was already in the mood for a party, didn't say no and soon the two of them were in the car. Danny was already hot. But to make it even more fun, Lucy pulled out the flower that Jack had snatched from her bag and opened it up to give Danny a taste of his own medicine. For the sake of the next activity, Danny didn't think too much and just did what Lucy said. But the next person who showed up was Sergeant Tom and everything that happened just now was in their plan. After returning to the police station, Danny wanted to use his identity to pressure Tom. But Tom didn't care. He not only knew that Danny was the legislative director, but also knew that the woman in the car wasn't his wife. Tom said that he had already reported this to his superiors, and the Congress also sent an agent to talk to Danny. Just as it finished speaking, Tanner and Jack, who claimed to be agents, entered the room. Tanner did not rush to question the other party, but first used words to intimidate the other party again. If this kind of behavior of his was reported by the major media. What would be the consequences? Danny was so scared that he couldn't count his words. Seeing that it was working well, the two men also got straight to the subject matter. They wanted to know more about the Lewings and asked Danny to tell them. But Danny was a little worried and didn't say anything. Tanner dialed Danny's wife's number to tell her about the day's events. The second he heard his wife's voice, Danny finally gave in. He told her everything he knew. It turns out that Little Wings was just a code name. The real thing was that they were working on an anti-missile software. Initially, it was only developed to protect commercial planes. But one day, they were suddenly approached by a civil aviation company. Jack guessed that the company was New Age. Danny admitted that it was New Age. They found out that the software could be tweaked. And once it was, it would allow the missile to defeat all known countermeasures. In short, the missile with this software, as long as you fire, even if the other side opens the air defense system, the missile can still hit the target. The reason why members of Congress are participating in this project is to let Congress know that Little Wing can help the U.S. military move into the future so that they will agree to fund and certify the Little Wing project. After getting the information they wanted, Jack and Tanner got up and left the interrogation room. Danny sees this and tries to ask if the charges can be dropped. Jack said, I'm not a cop, I don't know. After leaving the room, Jack talked to Tom. It turned out that a long time ago, after eradicating the Kleiner family, Tom had seen the world clearly, so he wanted to resign from the police force, intending to find a new job and live the rest of his life simply. Instead of agreeing to his resignation, his supervisor transferred him back to Boston. This led to the experience of cooperating with Jack to extract information from Danny. After all this, the two briefly said goodbye, and then the group began to head towards the hotel. Through Danny's description, several people also knew the risk of Little Wing. Once the software fell into the hands of hostile forces, it would undoubtedly set off an unpredictable disaster. So in order to avoid the risk, Jack decided to go to Homeland Security with Tanner and tell the other side all the information they have to see how the other side will make a decision. But before that, they must find a place to eat first. Then the car quickly drove to a restaurant. Several people parked the car, just walked down, was surrounded by a group of motorbike gangs. The leader of the group not only knew Jack's name, but also had his men take away all of their weapons, and also had his men put down their guns. Apparently, they thought it would be easy to deal with Jack and his gang without weapons. Jack was the first to attack, and knocked down a few people in a couple of punches. The rest of the gang had an easy time dealing with them. Jack punched, kicked and knocked down one of them, and then dragged the chain wielder off the motorbike. The rest of his comrades have also defeated their opponents. They didn't know that Jack and his men were all special forces. Although Jack and his men were outnumbered by their opponents, their force value far exceeded theirs. So the fight didn't last long and ended with the motorbike king being wiped out by the group. Jack knew that this group of people must have been instructed, so it took out his mobile phone from the body of the leading boss and directly pressed the number of the nearest communication. As usual, Jack taunts the bosses behind the scenes. The boss, Mike, accuses Jack of being a big influence. Jack joked about whether it was worth $65 million. Jack has already guessed the identity of the other party. That is, the boss of the security department, the mastermind of the whole incident. Obviously Mike also understands that Jack is a difficult opponent to deal with. So he wants to make a deal with Jack. As long as Jack is not involved in this matter, he can give him whatever he wants. Jack said he wanted to throw him out of the plane. Did Jack throw him out of the plane? Did Jack avenge the death of his comrade?
This is Zero Sense Film. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, comment and subscribe to my channel. See you in the next video.